Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today on a topic that is of great interest to anyone who works in public health and anyone who works in food safety, and that is how we can keep babies and toddlers safe from foodborne illness. I want to welcome you, and to those of you who have not been with us before, thanks for joining us. Next. We're, we're so glad to have you with us. I think we do have many new people here today, so I'm going to briefly tell you about us, the host organization. We're the nonprofit Partnership for Food Safety Education. We develop and promote effective education programs to reduce foodborne illness risk for consumers. We are a nonprofit. We rely on grants and donations. We also collaborate with a number of other nonprofits. And um, in the case today, you'll see uh, a collaboration we did with a leading university. Um, so it, you may be familiar with us uh, more as Fight Back and fightback.org, which is our, our main website. Next, please. Briefly, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. One is, uh, we love to get your questions. And Dr. Frazier is going to present um, research that uh, she developed. So we know you're going to want to ask questions. You can do that at any time during the webinar through the question function. Just type your question in there. And then we're going to have plenty of time towards the end to have those questions asked. So don't hesitate to submit a question. Also, after the webinar, you're going to receive a brief survey. Um, this is so important to us because it's the best way for us to know um, what your thoughts are on what we presented, what you're interested in seeing more of, and any criticisms you have of the, of the webinar. So please answer that um, so, uh, survey for us. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, continuing education units, very important aspect of our webinars. I want to call out um, and recognize the Association of Nutrition and Food Service Professionals. Some of you may be here because we are now offering ANFP CEUs. So thank you for being here. Also, the Commission on Dietetic Registration and the National Environmental Health Association terrific partners, and we love that you're here to earn CEUs. I know it's really important you get your certificate. So the best way and the most expedient way is to download it right here, right now, from um, the handout section that you'll see in the bar on the, the right-hand side. Under the question function, <clears throat> we have several handouts, including the CEU certificates. It, we will also include um, the link to get the CEU certificates in the email follow-up that goes out. And also, once the webinar is posted to our webinar recordings, they'll be there too. So um, we're not able to answer all the emails we get about getting your CEU certificate. We have offered many ways for you to get them. So again, if you're here live, um, getting them right here as a handout is probably the most expedient way. Um, next, I want to, you know, introduce our speaker or introduce and introduce myself. I'm Shelley Feist, Executive Director of the Partnership for Food Safety Education. Uh, with us today is Dr. Angela Frazier um, from Clemson University, and I'll introduce her in more detail later. Our webinar team also includes Michelle, who makes things go smoothly. So that's who's behind today's webinar. Our learning objectives um, for today's webinar include to identify risk factors. Next slide. To identify risk factors for foodborne disease in childcare settings. To identify ways to prevent foodborne disease in a childcare setting and at home, and to understand the science behind food, practice, food safety practices. We know many of you do work in food safety, and <clears throat> but it's always good to be reminded. And um, as you'll see, Dr. Frazier has some really interesting data about the child care environment. Next slide. <clears throat> Probably what brings many of you here today is you understand how uh, young children are at particular risk 
and there's special risks to these young people, um, babies and toddlers in particular. Their immune systems are not developed fully to fight off infections. Um, an estimated 300,000 illnesses affect children under age five in the U.S. each year. Um, that's according to the CDC. Uh, children under age five have the highest incidence rates of any age group um, for infections attributed to common foodborne pathogens, including Campylobacter, Cryptosporidium, E. coli 0157, E. coli non-0157, Salmonella, Chigella, and Yersinia. Um, again, there's great data from the CDC about these different pathogens and these incidence rates. Next slide. A little bit more about the special risks to young children. In children under age five, an E. coli infection can result in hemolytic uremic syndrome, also called HUS or abbreviated as HUS. It's a severe complication that can lead to liver failure and death. Um, it's something you may hear about when there are major outbreaks of E. coli. Um, normally, 6% of people with E. coli 0157 contract HUS, but 15% of children under age 5 develop the condition. So again, um, a particular risk for young children and a great concern to anyone who's trying to protect children from foodborne, foodborne illness. Um, we're going to move to the next slide, which we're going to launch a poll. Our first poll for the webinar, do you work with parents or caregivers of babies and toddlers. So Michelle will launch the poll and we'll leave it open for hmm, probably a minute. So please vote. Um, it's a lot of fun for everyone to see who's, who's with us here today and the kind of work you do. If you haven't yet voted, please do so. We're giving us your input. I guess it's not a vote, it's a poll. Okay, Michelle, if you could show us what people responded. Oh, wow, that's great. So we have... Uh, 77% of the people on this webinar do directly work with parents or caregivers. That's interesting. Thank you so much. Well, I'm very happy um, as we move forward to introduce to you um, Dr. Angela Frazier. She's been a collaborator with the partnership and we're greatly appreciative both of the great uh, project that we get to work on with her but also that she's with us today to talk about this. Um, she's Associate Professor and Food Safety Specialist in the Department of Food, Nutrition, and Packaging Sciences at Clemson University. She's worked in the area of food safety education since 1987, which is wonderful. She's done this in positions in government, teaching, and extension. She, extend, she attended Michigan State University, where she received her BS in dietetics, an MS in institutional administration, and in 1995, a PhD in food science. Before coming to Clemson University, she worked as an associate professor and extension specialist at NC State University and at Michigan State. She also taught in the School of Public Health, University of Michigan. And before earning her PhD, Dr. Fraser worked as an environmental health specialist for six years in the state of Michigan, which is a great job. And we have a lot of backfighters who work in environmental health. Um, her work in extension centers on development and evaluation of food safety programs targeting consumers in the retail and food service industry. Um, she also teaches undergraduate courses in nutrition and dietetics, one graduate course, and she mentors a creative inquiry team. Um, Angie, thank you so much for being with us. Great. Thank you so much, Shelley, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Okay, so um, 
today I'm going to talk about some of the science behind the messaging um, that the partnership has put out regarding how do you keep babies and toddlers safe from foodborne disease. Um, as Shelly has mentioned, several years ago, I had collaborated um, with her group um, as well as North Carolina State and Research Triangle Institute to conduct a, a project um, within child care. And this was a USDA funded project. And we visited 40 child care centers and homes in North Carolina and South Carolina. And we conducted observations, um, we conducted environmental audits, and we collected um, surface samples to determine how clean were the surfaces in these um, homes and centers that we visited. And I've just shared a couple of the key findings. Um, what was interesting is that over half of the homes did not keep foods at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below, you know, which is one of the messages um, of Fight Back is the importance of keeping foods cold. Also, um, clothing was the most commonly touched surface. And I think that's something that we really don't focus on a lot um, when we're focusing on food safety. But there's more and more evidence that show that's um, demonstrating how clothing and soft surfaces can serve as a vehicle for transferring um, bacteria and viruses from person to person. Um, also, another interesting um, finding was is that facilities without writ written surface cleaning or food preparation policies had statistically higher microbial counts on surfaces. And so um, from an educational perspective, we probably should be encouraging um, centers and homes um, to be putting in writing what are their standard operating procedures. And the good news um, was that there were no samples were positive for any of the four uh, bacterial pathogens that we um, tested for, but we did have four samples that were not confirmed that showed evidence of human norovirus um, RNA, which means that norovirus might have been present. Um, so the importance of conducting studies like this is that these research studies provide the evidence base for the messages that the partnership creates. And before I get started sharing a little bit about the science behind the um, five messages um, that Shelly's going to talk about a little bit later in the webinar, I need to emphasize that as, as I've said, research informs the evidence and the evidence informs the messages. There's always new research studies coming out. And so um, we like to look at the current research and evaluate, was it a high quality study? So sometimes the evidence changes. And so what you'll know if you've been in this field a long time, that recommendations will change over time based on the quality of the evidence. Um, next, Michelle. So um, infant formula, um, which is commonly used when feeding um, babies and toddlers, we have to be really careful about the safety um, and how we handle infant formula. So there's three forms, ready to feed or ready to use, concentrated liquid or dry. And so ready to feed formula and concentrated liquid formula are all um, commercially sterile products, which means that when you open the container, that it is safe to eat. Um, dry formula, which is commonly used, is not a sterile product. So you have to think, you have to be very careful about how you use each of these different types. So ready to feed, um, there's no problem. You don't add any water to that. Um, um, whereas concentrated liquid, you do need to add water. Um, and what, you, what, what one needs to be very concerned about is the source of the water, um, because that's really critical. And if you're on public water, public water supplies are um, routinely tested. And so if there is a problem with the quality of the um, public water supply, um, the consumers will be alerted to that. If you're um, using water from a well, you need to be really cautious about that. Um, well water should be tested on a regular basis, but oftentimes it is not. And what we need to be most concerned about are the presence of col coliforms, which are indicators that there could be fecal contamination of a product um, or nitrates. Um, so if you're working with clients um, who are using well water, you really wanna emphasize that they need to have that water tested. If they don't wanna bother with that, um, and then it would be best to recommend um, that they use bottled water. And so. That recommendation would apply to if you're using concentrated liquid or dry. And the reason that we're really concerned about dry formula 
again, it's not a sterile product. And so during the br drying process, um, bacteria that might be present can be injured. And these injured bacteria can survive in that dry product for up to two years. And so they're essentially dormant until you reconstitute the product with water. Um, and so then you create a nice environment for these um, organisms to grow out and they could be present in the formula and you could sicken the baby or the toddler who's being fed with it. Um, so again, in closing, if you're gonna be using concentrated or dried formula, you really need to be careful about the, the water that you're using. Um, tap water is safe to use if it comes from a public water supply. It's safe to use if it comes from a well, um, as long as the well water has been tested. Um, but to be even safer, use bottled water. Um, next. Um, also, when you're feeding um, the child, um, bacteria can be introduced if the bottles and the nipples are not properly cleaned and sanitized before use. And I think we often underestimate the importance of cleaning and sanitizing surfaces as a whole. Uh, so simply cleaning with soap and water um, will not decrease the microbial pathogen load on the surfaces. So it is recommended um, that you sterilize um, bottles and nipples in boiling water. Now, having said that, there is some research that suggests that you only need to do that when you um, initially buy the bottle and nipples. Um, other research suggests that um, you should sterilize the bottle and nipples um, in boiling water um, before every use. And again, in the absence of conclusive evidence, we like to take the most safe route. So we're gonna recommend um, that you should sterilize um, the bottles and nipples in boiling water after every use or before every use. Um, next. Breast milk. Um, breast milk um, naturally contains nutrients that are essential for growth. Also, it contains um, antimicrobials um, and other protective substances. And I did a little research on breast milk and just a little interesting factoid is that in the early 20th century, um, infants who did not, who were not fed with their uh, mother's milk were six times more likely to die in the first year than infants who were breastfed. And so I think just that little factoid illustrates the importance of breastfeeding um, and of breast milk. However, we need to make sure that we're doing it safely. Or, so breast milk is not sterile. Um, again, it contains um, essential nutrients that bacteria um, need to grow. And so bacteria can grow in breast milk if it is not held at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below after expressing. And so, um, you can keep breast milk out at room temperature for about four hours, but it is strongly encouraged um, that after expressing the breast milk, um, that you put it in a clean and sterile container and put it into the refrigerator. And making sure that the refrigerator is working at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. And I know that Shelley's group does a really good job of promoting the need um, to um, uh, put thermometers um, into a refrigeration unit. Um, and so expressed breast milk is safe up to 48 hours if refrigerated. Now, while expressing the breast milk, it's really important um, that the container in which you're going to express it is properly cleaned um, and that hands are properly washed. The skin, on our skin, we have hundreds of different types of bacteria and fungi. And most of these bacteria are not um, uh, pathogenic, so they're not gonna cause um, illness, um, but some can um, under certain conditions. And so that's why it's really important to make sure that the containers are properly cleaned and sanitized, um, as well as your hands are properly washed before beginning expressing breast milk. Um, next. Baby food. Um, so as I've already mentioned um, in regard or in relation to um, breast milk, there are many different types of bacteria, hundreds of them um, uh, naturally found on our skin. And we call that the skin microbiota or our natural flora. And again, most are not pathogenic. So one pathogen that uh, many back fighters have heard of is Staphylococcus aureus. And it's found on the skin of about 30 to 40% of people. 
and in nasal cavities. And so it can be introduced into baby food during feeding, which is why we have very rigorous um, messaging about how to handle baby food. So just think about when you're feeding a baby. You, you put the spoon into the food and you put the spoon into the mouth. Well, all the food doesn't always get into the mouth. So you might be scraping um, baby food uh, off of the skin around the mouth. And so what could happen is that any staph or other um, uh, bacteria that might be on the skin could be introduced back into the baby food. Um, and so once it's introduced into that baby food, and if that baby food isn't held at proper temperatures, that bacteria could grow. And the next time you feed the baby, um, there could be a sufficient number of bacteria um, in the food, or the bacteria might have even formed toxins, which could infect the, the child and make them sick. Um, and so that's why it's really, really important that when you open a container of baby food to portion out how much food that you want into a container and then put the unused portion, cap it and put it back into the refrigerator. Um, next, Michelle. Diapering. Um, children, like adults, can excrete pathogens in their feces, even if they show no signs of illness. Um, and so um, some of the research evidence suggests that noroviruses can be shed for 25 days after the onset of diarrhea. So you might have a child who is exhibiting symptoms of foodborne disease, such as di um, diarrhea, and they get better. Um, but keeping in mind that some of these organisms, even while there are no symptoms, um, the individual can continue to shed the organisms. And that's the same with rotaviruses. Rotaviruses have been shown um, to shed um, in fecal matter between 25 and 57 days after the onset of diarrhea. So um, the message here is that it is really, really important to keep diapering surfaces clean. Um, next. So um, diaper changing pads or tables can come into contact with dirty diapers and feces. And something that I observed when I was out conducting um, the child care study that I referenced earlier, I saw in some family daycare homes, um, providers changing diapers on living room couches. Um, and they would put a um, sheet of paper down and then put the child on top of the sheet of paper on the couch. Well, there can be obviously seepage through that paper, and it is very, very difficult to um, clean and disinfect soft surfaces such as a couch or even the carpeting on the floor. So it is really important to make sure that the diaper changing table or pad is a hard surface um, um, because hard surfaces are much easier to clean and sanitize. Also, if it is a hard surface or if it's a soft surface, um, when children are placed on this surface, you know, their hands can touch the surface and their clothes can become contaminated. And think back to one of my um, original comments or my first comments, one of the most, the most commonly touched surface in childcare were clothes. So you have a child who is on a diaper um, changing table, their clothes can become contaminated another provider picks them up or they come in contact with other children. So there could be possibly um, transmission of microorganisms um, because of a child being on an, un an improperly cleaned and sanitized um, diaper changing table. And then also these children, their hands come in contact with the diaper changing table. Um, they can touch it and then they eat without washing their hands or um, as, as those of you who work with children know, um, it's part of child development that um, uh, children like to put thing, objects into their mouths. And so it's a good way for organisms to be introduced um, into a child's system and possibly make them sick. So it is really, really important to make sure that diaper changing tables and pads are only on hard surfaces and that those hard surfaces are properly cleaned and sanitized um, after every use. Um, next. Hand hygiene. Um, we've got a lot of work to do in this area. Um, 
you know, most of the research shows that compliance rates for um, proper um, implementation of hand washing practices is pretty abysmal. And so there's a lot of research being done um, to determine how can we get people to wash their hands more. Um, well, hand washing is well documented to reduce the incidence of diarrheal illness by as much as 30 to 40 percent. So it's what I would call a low technology strategy that can significantly decrease exposure to pathogens that can cause foodborne disease and diarrheal disease. And in fact, um, um, in the American Public Health Association's Control of Communicable Diseases Manual, and this manual is used all over the world, um, of the 142 communicable diseases that are described within that manual, hand washing is listed for nearly 30% of them as a prevention control. So the evidence is very strong demonstrating how important hand washing is to preventing foodborne disease and diarrheal disease. Um, next. So we know that you know one of the big problems is the fecal oral transmission because that's um, as we eat um, contaminated food and it goes through our intestinal tract, um, one way to expel um, pathogens is either through vomiting or diarrhea. And so if we don't, um, if we do not properly clean and sanitize surfaces um, that come in contact with fecal matter, and then we our hands come in contact with them, our hands can serve as a vehicle for spreading pathogens from one surface to another. Um, and so just think in a um, child care setting. And, and again, when I was working on the child care project, I got sick twice during that project. Um, and it took me um, the second time I got sick to realize, oh my gosh, because I was in the child care setting, touching surfaces and collecting data. Um, and so here's some different modes of transmission um, related to hands. Um, as already said, infants and toddlers frequently place objects and hands in their mouths. And, that's part of their development process. So you can't stop children from doing that. And it is near impossible to constantly clean and sanitize all those objects. Um, and there was a research study, and this was done with adults, but this is just to illustrate um, how important hands are in um, the spread of pathogens. Um, hands were contaminated, like a, what we would call a patient zero, their hands were, con um, were contaminated. Um, and then they shook the hands of five different people. In a, and they shook the hands of person two, then person two shook the hands of person three. And what was discovered is that the first three people whose hands were touched or um, who touched the patient zero were still positive for the contaminant. So it illustrates how important hand washing is. And what I encourage all of you to do is to really focus on um, or emphasize to providers or even at home the importance of cleaning and sanitizing what we would call high touch surfaces. And that would include toys, balls, window sills for children, walkers, cabinets, doorknobs, light switches, etc. And I think these types of objects, particularly like cabinets and doors and light switches, are often not properly cleaned and sanitized, and they are high touch surfaces that could serve um, as a vehicle for spreading uh, microorganisms from one surface to another. Um, next. Um, but as I've already said, hand hygiene is easier said than done. So our work is cut out for us. And here are just some of the challenges to getting children to wash their hands. And, and we're focusing today on babies and toddlers, and obviously with babies, um, the provider's going to have to do that. Um, younger children need assistance. Um, that's an obvious statement. Um, and some may not have the motor skills to wash their own hands, while others might not be able to reach the sink. One of my observations conducting the child care study was that there were sinks in the rooms, but most were not, um, that they were not able, they were not, uh, the, a small child was not able to go to the sink and wash their hands. They actually had to have a provider lift them up. And it just took more time for the provider to be able to wash the child's hands, which I think created a barrier to providers um, having children wash their hands. So that's something that needs to be considered when designing um, child care centers and homes. Um, also, most children under age 18 months are not coordinated enough to safely stand on a stool without assistance. So 
children um, while washing their hands need to be properly um, supervised. Um, next. Um, lastly, I'm just going to share um, that as part of the project that I worked on with Shelley, North Carolina State and uh, Research Triangle Institute, we created two sets of materials. Um, and on the slides here, if you just go to fightback.org, they're under the Four Kids tab and Child Care Training. And we created these very in-depth fact sheets um, about different tasks that you would complete in a child care, such as like handling fresh produce safely, um, cleaning housekeeping surfaces, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these are available um, in electronic form um, on the Fight Back website. And then Shelley's group created what um, are called crib sheets. And these crib sheets are distilling that information um, that I just mentioned into a more um, ready to use format for people to use in their home. Um, and so what you're seeing on the um, slide set right now, the listing of the fact sheets, all of those fact sheets are designed for child care providers. And the crib sheets are designed for people caring for children, their own babies in their home. Um, next. Okay, I'm gonna turn the webinar back over to Shelly, um, who's gonna talk about some specific tips that you can implement to keep babies and toddlers safe. Thank you, Angie. I, um, it's, it's great to be reminded of the work you did, and I actually think, um, next slide, um, as I go through this, Angie, I ask you to like jump in where you want, if there's, um, type up if there's, you know, if a, a tip is backed up by the research your team did and you want to see more about it. Because uh, what we're going to talk about right now is how the partnership, partnership um, has sort of distilled top five tips into um, quick bites of action for parents and caregivers. And, um, and then we'll cover also how that's backed up with the crib sheet information. So next slide. Um, our first tip um, is around, is on baby formula. Now, the issue here as we show, you know, the dry formula being used isn't so much the type, but rather the point being that you should only mix enough formula for one feeding um, using a clean and sterilized baby bottle. So this would include mixing um, the concentrated uh, liquid formula also. Um, this is an issue, of course, around um, that you don't want to encourage um, too much to be mixed, to have it be wasted, um, and also the, the shelf life um, is, is, as we're recommending, 48 hours if refrigerated. So the first tip, um, next slide, is really about mixing the formula, mixing only enough for one feeding, not adding new formula to a half-filled bottle of previously mixed formula, and then after feeding the baby to, you know, throw out leftover um, formula, particularly if that is uh, formula that had already been held in the refrigerator. So um, this is, again, just a, a quick tip to say uh, not to mix more formula than you're going to feed in one feeding. So next slide, please. And as Dr. Fraser mentioned, um, refrigeration, proper refrigeration is very important. Um, so we wanted to emphasize the 40 or below. Um, there's so much research that shows that this is a critical thing, particularly in the home, um, and that breast milk and prepared formula uh, needs to be refrigerated at 40 degrees or below. And that the tips around that are that um, this hinders the growth of bacteria. Um, and that an appliance thermometer should be used to check to be sure refrigerators at 40 or below. Um, this is the basis of a campaign we have called Go 40 or Below. Um, there's a lot more detail there also about home refrigeration, about why this is, this is so important, knowing the temperature of your refrigerator. So that's tip two. So moving on, next slide to tip three on baby food. Um, the baby food should not be fed directly from the jar of food. And of course, as we all know now, 
baby food is coming in all kinds of packaging, not just jars, but that a portion should be placed in into a clean bowl and, and fed so that you're not using, you know, dipping the spoon back into the jar and then keeping that food in the refrigerator. So um, pour, putting, pouring out a portion of food or scooping out a portion and um, feeding for that one feeding, keeping leftovers in the fridge. The uh, next slide um, gets into more detail of this. And, and we have a flyer, we'll talk about how to get that, that does um, highlight each of these tips and then some of the specifics behind it. Um, next slide for tip number four on diaper changing. Here we really just wanted to emphasize that it's important to not change diapers in your kitchen or eating area. <laughs> um, and then someone on Facebook said, why do you, this is so sad you even have to say this, but of course, I mean, I think, I think it's very important just to, it highlights that back, these kinds of bacteria um, need to be kept away from food preparation areas. So in the next slide, um, yeah, we use the term off limits. Kitchen and eating areas are off limits for diaper changing. Always change diapers in the same location in your home and keep germs confined to one area, um, which we know germs will move around through clothing hands. Um, and then washing child, your hands and your child's hands. And I'm interested, I mean, you know, talk to Dr. Fraser and listen to this about maybe doing some more um, tips that might be around the matter of um, hard surfaces and surface cleaning um, relating to diaper changing. And the next tip, number five, is, is a good one. We wanted to illustrate an adult helping a child wash their hands and taking time to help young children wash hands properly. Um, these graphics are all, by the way, downloadable at fightback.org slash kids, and we encourage you to use them in any way you like, um, including on social media. Um, next slide is really just, you'll all be familiar with the hand washing steps. So as we promote this graphic about taking time to help kids wash hands properly, we'll also be promoting you know, the specific CDC instructions for how to do that correctly and thoroughly. And as Dr. Frazier talked about, this is so important. Um, in the, it's a, as important as the ho in the home, if not more so than in the child care setting. So hand washing is a big area of emphasis. Um, in the next slide, um, again, highlighting that these uh, or original illustrations um, and these shareable graphics are available at fightback.org slash kids. If you've been following us on Facebook, um, you'll see we've been promoting this, and through Father's Day, we will be promoting this. Um, we started around Mother's Day. Um, so please go to the website, or if you're on Facebook, please like us or share these posts. Um, next slide. We've, we've got some other free downloads. Um, Dr. Fraser mentioned the crib sheets. We call them crib sheets. If you go to fightback.org slash kids, in addition to seeing in a very simple layout each of these tips and those graphics, under each of them is a, the crib sheet that relates to that tip. And the crib sheets are a one page and they can be used as a handout that gives a lot more depth, but not in um, difficult language. Um, it gives more information that um, a consumer could use for that topic. So say we have one crib cre sheet on preparing formula, one on handling and storage of baby food, one on hand washing, surface cleaning. Um, the other free downloads, we really encourage you to, oh, and I, I the crib sheet, by the way, the, the crib sheet combination where we put all the crib sheets in one document is one of the attachments here under handouts also if that's an easier way for you to access it. Um, the other downloads we want to emphasize are a great uh, flyer from foodsafety.gov that's on food safety for children under age five. That gets into things like uh, raw or undercooked foods, 
um, about unpasteurized foods. So that expands a little more into the um, the 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 baby the children who are eating solid foods. Um, and then again, we have two other items that you might want to use in your outreach. One is a PowerPoint that you can put your own cover on, your own um, information on, uh, and show to a consumer audience that highlights these tips, basically just talks through the tips and shows the, the graphics. So hopefully that's of use to those of you who are working with um, groups of people who may be parents of, or caretakers to young children. And the flyer. There is a flyer, um, it's two-sided, at Fight Back Go to Our Kids. It highlights, it's in two sections, feeding babies and toddlers, and then cleaning and sanitizing. So that's a summary of the material that is available for you right now to get at foodfightback.org slash kids. And uh, next slide, please. So before we get to questions, we do want to um, launch our second poll about how likely you may be to be using these free resources within the next three months. So thanks for your responses, and we'll leave this poll open for about 30 seconds. So please, please let us know if you think you'll be using them. Please take the poll if you haven't had a chance to yet. Okay, Michelle, why don't you let us see what people have to say about these resources? All right, that's great. 56% of you say you're very likely to use them. Um, I want to say too, and 36% somewhat likely, I want to say also that in the follow-up survey, that's why I really like you to take that for sure, we give you some open-ended space to just give us any feedback you want to about the resources or the webinar, so thank you. All right, we're going to move into questions. And as I pull up a question, and I'll, I'll fill the questions to, um, to Angie, um, Angie, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more. Um, you talked about how this research was translated into what's really a pretty comprehensive set of training, um, you know, documents. Um, do you, can you talk a little bit more about who might be most likely to be able to use this training material? Okay. Um, and what, so, your, what some of your intention was about how you organized it and that kind of thing, just briefly to help those who might be thinking of using it. Okay, so the training materials um, that are available on the Fight Back website were designed for child care provider trainers or child care providers who were lead trainers at their centers. And so the way the materials are organized is that each is by a task that you would complete in a center or a home. So as I mentioned, produce, handling, diapering, cleaning soft surfaces, et cetera. And um, I had a project coordinator who worked with me on this, um, Courtney Leone. Courtney spent a lot of time searching the literature because as I mentioned at the very beginning of the webinar, it is so important um, that we're using good quality evidence to inform um, the practice statements that we're making. Courtney um, spent a lot of time searching the literature. So at the very beginning of each of these, what I'm calling fact sheets that were bundled into a booklet, um, is the why do you need to do this? And for each fact sheet, we've cited all the literature um, that we've um, that we use to inform our recommendations. So we have the public health um, rationale as well as very descriptive, um, detailed steps as to what one needs to do. It's probably a little high level for you know, distributing to people, um, to consumers in their home, but I think the materials, we work very hard to try to keep them um, easy to read and understand. They're very appropriate for child care center providers 
and probably even family daycare home providers who are attending a training. And again, all of it's free and downloadable um, on the Fight Back website. Okay, thank you. And and that's kind of, you mentioned it's probably too advanced for small setting home daycare, and that's, I think, where the crib sheet can be helpful. Too. Yes. Um, crib sheets. Okay, we're going to go into some questions. I'm going to take the first question because it was about, um, let me get back to it. Okay, when the percentage of people and children who develop HUS is listed, and this was early in the webinar, is that a percentage of the general population of those who are affected or specifically affected by E. coli? That is for those affected by E. coli. So of those affected with by E. coli, and that's only E. coli 0157, H, or 0157, 6% of adults may develop HUS, but 15% of children under age 5. So... I hope that answers that. Um, and then we have a couple of questions, understandably, uh, they're kind of worded different ways, but Dr. Fraser one's on, is sterilization via, via dishwasher strong enough? You know, okay. two questions about that versus okay. boiling. Okay, excellent question. And so it's going to depend on the dishwasher. Um, for example, a lot of the newer dishwashers um, are able to sterilize, um, you know, the items that are in the dishwasher during the during the final rinse step. And so, what you would just need to do is to refer to the manufacturer manual to see if the final rinse um, is a sterilization step. I know my dishwasher at home, um, the final step is a is it's a sterilization step. Okay, great. Um, this is a Good question. Um, I'm thinking how to put this. This is from Danica. Saying that breast, many breast pump companies use a 555 rule, five hours at room temp, five days in fridge, five months in freezer, which doesn't follow the recommendations listed here. How do you think we can standardize guidelines to ensure we're keeping babies healthy? And I guess I would focus in on the issue of um, how long can, you know, breast milk and formula be kept in the fridge? And I know this is somewhat a topic of discussion within WIC, and um, I, and, and uh, we are saying 48 hours, which I know is fairly conservative. So is there anything you'd say about that, um, Angie? That, that is an excellent, excellent question. And it's one of the challenges we face when coming up, when, when um, creating um, food safety messages. So in preparation for um, the webinar, um, I went back and I reread, it's a, it's a book, and if any of you are um, work with a lot of breastfeeding moms, um, it's called Breastfeeding, A Guide for the Medical Profession. And it's, a, it's, it's the seminal book on how to work with um, breastfeeding women. And even within this text, um, there are different recommendations um, for how long you can store um, breast milk um, at room temperature, in the refrigerator, in the freezer. And the reason for that, it all depends on whose research study you are um, referencing. So some research studies might show that you can store breast milk in the freezer for three months or five months. Um, and actually in this book, there was one study that suggested you could store it in the freezer for 12 months. And so I think the answer is, and I think that this is what the partnership is doing, is to bring together um, all interested parties. And I think it's important for those parties can come together and to discuss the evidence and perhaps come up with one message. Um, you know, and, and this continues to be a challenge within the nutrition world and in other worlds. So um, I think that um, the 555 rule is, is not unsafe, um, um, but we don't have conclusive evidence to support that. And so in the absence of conclusive evidence, we use the more conservative recommendation. Yeah, thank you. It is always a challenge <laughs> and is more conservative. Um, okay. This, this is a good question that I think we can answer fairly quickly and, and is part of our outreach on social media around these tips. 
how long is it safe to keep open but unserved portions of baby food in the original container? Could this info be included along with recommendations that the jar should be labeled with the date it was open? Yeah, and we have been talking about that. And of course, it's in the crib sheet. Um, it's actually also, I think, in the food keeper for, we would say, two to three days. I, I think, is that Angie? Uh, um, something you guys looked at? Yeah, I would have to go back and check the, I mean, it's it, usually it's about um, three to four days that we would recommend, but that's actually not necessarily grounded in good quality evidence. That's just a educated mm -hmm. guess as to how long we think that that food would be safe. Yeah, and it, so there and even, it, and again, we're pretty conservative on that, and I think USDA is pretty conservative on mm -hmm. um, on those things about leftovers. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a lot of good questions. Thank you. Um, the material, these tips are not available in Spanish at this time. Um, and it's something I want to see how they're received and um, very possible that they, that they will be uh, at a later time. Um, all right. Oh, here's a good question for you, Angie. About, do you mean sterilize or sanitize? And how would you say the difference between sterilize, sanitize, and disinfect? Okay, there are legal definitions. Um, so again, this is another really, really good question. Um, so there's a difference between sanitizing, disinfecting, and sterilizing. When you sterilize an object, um, you're eliminating all of the microorganisms on that object. Whereas when you are sanitizing an object, you're just reducing the number of organisms that are on that surface. Um, and so, <coughs> excuse me, so, when we're talking about preparing bottles and nipples for feeding, we're talking about sterilizing, so eliminating all the microorganisms that might be on that surface. Okay, terrific. Oh, here's a, these are really good questions. This this topic is ripe for good questions. Um, Oh, I'd love this one to be you, Angie. Uh, one of the crib sheets gives a recipe for sanitizing solution using bleach and water. And the sheet says this is safe to use on toys and surfaces. It, and it's, is it safe f for kitchen use? Is it, if, is it diluted enough to not harm a child if they came in contact to a freshly sanitized surface? Um, good question. Um, I would say yes, because the concentration is usually 50 to 100 parts per million. And um, that concentration is widely recommended within the public health community. Um, it's recommended within the FDA food code. And in some states, the FDA food code applies to child care centers. And so, um, the key is, is that you need to monitor how that sanitizer solution is prepared to make sure that it is not, that, that you're not adding too much bleach. Be, um, so monitoring to make sure that the sanitizer solution is prepared between 50 and 100 parts per million is a critical step if you are concerned about children um, coming in contact with a freshly sanitized surface. Okay, thank you. We're going to take one more question and then we'll we'll move to closure. Um, and this maybe gets to what you observed in the child care environment about hand washing. Um, how many times per 24 hours should a crawling eight-month-old wash or, or sanitize their hands? This is from Jim. And is, is there anything you'd add about hand washing, what you observed and child care environment you know i'm not you guys are asking some really really good questions and, and this is the <laughs> challenge of fighting back <laughs> yeah. um I don't, I don't have an answer for you jim um you know as we know children um are going to be crawling on the carpet um uh, and their hands are going to be contacting a lot of quote dirty surfaces and so um i don't i can't give you a prescriptive number as to how often the child should wash their hands um so 
if the child comes in contact with a grossly contaminated surface, like, you know, after diapering or touching the garbage, whatnot, then obviously that you should um, um, wash their hands. Um, but the other message is, is that try to keep the surfaces cleaned and sanitized because we know children are going to contact them routinely throughout the day. And so um, there really is no answer to your question. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's move. Can we move the slides forward? Um, we're going to move into our, our closing, but we're going to talk about a few more resources. Fightback.org, again, is a resource for oh, produce pro. Don't wing it. Go 40 or below. Safe uh, summer without salmonella. Don't wing it. Uh, the child care training, the crib sheets on, on taking care of babies and toddlers. Um, next slide, please. I want to shout out that this work um, to develop these tips and this outreach, which is actually going to be going out to parents and caretakers, caregivers, um, is made possible by the American uh, grant from the American Legion Child Welfare Foundation. So we thank them for their support. Uh, next slide, we recognize that our the Partnership for Food Safety Education has some leading sponsoring partners who make our work possible and we thank them. Uh, in the next slide, we acknowledge um, that we have a wide range of partners and we work with the federal agencies. We have uh, association, professional association partners, some corporate partners, and uh, everyone involved is committed to making sure that consumers have access to um, food safety and hand hygiene information. Um, in the next two slides, I want to highlight we've got our next event is June 20th. It's the next in our series on the behavior ch on behavior change about design thinking. So please sign up for that. You won't want to miss it. The series is really great, and we really get um, into how you can design um, outreach um, around some principles in behavior change. And we'll have a guest from RTI. Um, on that webinar. Um, next event we're looking forward to, it's, it's actually a ways away, but not so far away, especially if you are needing to include money in your budget, um, your organization's budget, to be able to come to the next Consumer Food Safety Education Conference. Uh, from Consumers to Chef, Food Safety Education Matters. This is in Orlando, Florida, at the Swan and Dolphin Resort, March uh, 2019, so make plans for that. Um, next, I want to make a bit of a shout out. If you like our webinars, if you love our website, if you uh, participate in our knowledge exchanges, you get our weekly emails, um, please review us on Great Nonprofits. We are working to get a 2018 Great Nonprofit recognition these recognitions are important to us. They tell our donors and uh, they tell our users that um, others uh, support what we do and use what we do, what we create, and and um, love it. So, uh, just go to greatnonprofits.org and search Partnership for Food Safety Education, and we'd love you to post um, something uh, about your experience with us. I'm going to give a, on the next slide a final reminder because I know your CEU certificates are super important. So download them right now from the sidebar under the downloads um, section or handout section. Or look in your follow-up email because we'll guide you to where to get the CEU certificates. Or wait about uh, probably 24 to 30 hours for the um, recording and um, along with the recording we we put the CEU certificates uh, and then finally next slide we're reminding you that the survey is going to pop up please take it it's your chance to give us feedback or even suggest future topics I want to finally um, thank Dr. Frazier for being with us it's been a lot of fun and um, Really, a great reminder, I feel, as I listen to this topic of you know how much work we have to do. this is super duper important to uh, <laughs> to reach not only parents but people who are taking care of children. Um, 
and I want to thank you for your passion around the subject and your long work in food safety education is, is really inspiring for all of us. Um, final slide, and thank you so much for to all the folks who have joined us today. I know many of you may be new to our work, and we are very happy to have you as part of the community of backfighters. So thank you very much. If you want to get a hold of me and Angie, here's how you can reach us. And wishing you all a great afternoon.